Okay, I think that we are going to get this thing going now. It's about seven o'clock on the dot here in the Pacific time. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Brenna Leftwich and I am an academic and industry relations manager with Aspen Dental. I specialize in working with hygiene schools and dental schools from the West Coast to the Midwest. Uh, so it's kind of a, a big territory for myself here. I work for ADMI, which is Aspen Dental Management Inc. And we are the company who supports our Aspen Dental practices. Uh, with me, I have Natalie Bergman, who is a registered dental hygienist and also Dr. Paul Lamoro. I will introduce them here in a minute or let them introduce themselves. Um, I just wanna let you guys know, so I have all of your Google form questions that you guys submitted here. Um, so if you see me looking to my right, I swear I'm paying attention. <laughs> I just am trying to organize these questions for you. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, you also have a live Q&A option. So if you have any questions or follow-up questions that you wanted to submit on here as we go, feel free to do that and I will answer those as quickly as I can and hopefully get through all of these questions for you guys. Um, and again, this is an ask me anything session. So don't hold back, uh, ask literally anything. These guys right here are happy to answer any questions, the easy ones, the hard ones, whatever you guys want to know. Uh, with that being said, I will let our panelists introduce themselves. Paul, would you like to go first? <laughs> uh, sure. <clears throat> so my name is, uh, Paul Amro. I'm working, uh, oh, a little over a year now. I run an office in Grants Pass, Oregon. I graduated from OHSU Dental School in 2019. I served on the ASDA Board of Trustees, the Oregon Dental Association Board of Trustees, and uh, a few other things. I kept very busy during uh, during dental school, and I, I had probably the same experience that you guys had. I graduated high school, went to college, got a degree in rhetoric analysis, found out there are not jobs for that. Um, ran a martial arts school for eight years until my wife told me that I needed to go back to school and be a dentist. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, Paul definitely has his, his unique story and had a whole lifetime here before Aspen Dental and dental school in general. Uh, Natalie, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Natalie Bergman. I'm a registered dental hygienist. I work at Aspen Dental in Vancouver, Washington. Um, I've been working there for just shy of a year. Um, I have two boys, so outside of work, I am busy with my family and love being outdoors um, and really just enjoy living life. Awesome. Well, that is great. And we definitely appreciate you both being on here. Um, I'm really excited. We have great panelists on tonight. Um, with that being said, I will get started with the uh, Google form questions that you guys have submitted. Uh, there were some repeat questions, so I definitely clumped some things together and, and tried to keep it organized. Um, and as you can see, we do have a, a doctor and a hygienist on this call, which is pretty great. So we'll definitely cover all aspects of being within a practice. Uh, to start us off, I have a very broad question here for you. Um, so it is, why Aspen Dental? And to kind of follow up on that, did you start with Aspen Dental or another DSO or private practice? And if you did start with Aspen Dental, did you look into other options? Uh, so we'll go one at a time here. Do you want to start, Dr. Lamro? Mm -hmm. Um. Sure. So uh, I, I mentioned my wife me to be a dentist, and that's because uh, her father is a dentist. So my original plan in going to dental school was I was going to work in practice. Um, about midway through my third year, I went and I worked with him for a while, and he had cut back his, uh, his patient base quite a bit, and we realized that there wasn't really a two-doctor practice there, and uh, I suddenly needed to find a job. So now, luckily, I had been, you know, doing – things with ASDA and I knew a lot of people. So I called like Brenna and, you know, everybody and was like, Hey, I, I really want to interview. I want to know what's out there. So I, I applied with Aspen. I also applied with several other DSOs, private practice, um, a prison, which didn't interview me, which I was sad about, um, public health, and a 
private practices, and I really had a list of things that I wanted. Um, one of the big ones was autonomy and treatment planning. Like I wanted to diagnose and do my own treatment. I feel that's very important as a dentist that I'm going to, you know, do things that I believe in and I feel like I'm going to be successful in completing. Um, I also had an area in Oregon that I really wanted to live in, uh, the Southern Oregon area. And really the only offer that I got that made sense for us that put me in that circle that I wanted to live in and gave me, you know, the autonomy to practice the way I want, um, the support structure to, you know, learn new techniques and pursue CE and, you know, work with basically any material or technique that I want to explore um, was asked. Awesome. Yeah. And, and Dr. Lamro is definitely a great example because he was so involved with ASDA and definitely got to know his options, which I think is probably something he would recommend. Whatever you think is best for you, you only find that out by exploring and, and asking the right questions. Um, and so what, what about you, Natalie? Uh, why Aspen Dental? Yeah, um, as soon as I got my license, I started looking for jobs immediately and I wasn't really sure if I wanted to do private practice or where, um, where I wanted to end up. So I explored all options. Um, I did some temp jobs at a few private practice um, offices and I liked them. There was nothing wrong with what they had to offer, but I knew someone who worked for Aspen Dental and they were hiring in Vancouver. So um, I had applied and they called me in for an interview and they had a lot to offer what, what I was looking for, competitive pay, um, a solid full-time schedule, um, a lot of autonomy and benefits also so it just felt like it was a right fit for me and very close to home mm -hmm. so um i went with it awesome and you know we are happy that you did um me and too. <laughs> uh here we have a question specifically for you natalie uh it says mm -hmm. from a hygiene perspective what have you found is the biggest benefit of working for a dso um and just to tap on, for those of you who don't know, a DSO stands for Dental Service Organization or Dental Support Organization. And basically it is a company that supports the dental practices. We handle all the, the business aspects of running a practice and let our clinicians handle all the clinical aspects of running a practice. So if you hear DSO, that's, that's just a fancy way of, of saying we do all of that for you guys. So again, Natalie, from a hygiene perspective, what is the, the biggest benefit that you found of working for a DSO? The biggest benefit, that's hard to say what the biggest one was. There were many benefits. Um, I would say autonomy was the biggest for me. I am the only hygienist in the office and get to do all of my treatment planning, which was um, obviously with the dentist backing me up, um, but I really uh, wanted that aspect of hygiene. Um, I really appreciate that. And also the full-time um, offer that I was given. Mm -hmm. And Paul, just to get a, a doctor perspective on that, what do you feel is the biggest benefit of working for a DSO? Oh, gee. Um, <laughs> one of the things about Aspen is we, we have uh, something like 803 offices or whatnot. So there's just a, a huge, huge uh, network and resource base um, you get to meet a lot of other doctors. You get to, you know, work with a lot of different mentors. When I started, I onboarded um, up in Washington and Spokane with a Dr. Molesky, who's amazing. I, I worked with uh, Dr. Sager for a couple minutes in, uh, in Vancouver as well. And these are people that I still have, you know, in my phone when I'm looking at an x-ray or, you know, thinking like, do, do I want to extract this too? Should I refer this? Um, these are people that I can send a message to and help immediately get back to me and it's like, yeah, no, you should take that out. Here's how you're going to approach it. Here's an article you should look at. This is a great video. Here's, you know, another resource for you. So that uh, networking community of, you know, those kind of offices is something that you just often don't have, um, you know, in any other modality. Yeah, definitely. No, that, that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, 
And here we have, this is one of my absolute favorite questions when I do, when I do lunch and learns. Um, do you have quotas that you need to fill within your office? Um, Paul, I see you laughing. I want you to take this one first. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like at some point I probably asked that question. Um, <laughs> and it, uh, looking, at, looking at the autonomy piece, there, there are no quotas. Like I'm, I'm the doctor. If I'm looking at a tooth and be like, this tooth, you know, I can save it with a filling. I do a filling. If it's a tooth where I'm like, no, nah, this tooth needs a crown, I, I do a crown. There's no one that, uh, you know, is um, overlooking that part. In fact, in our contractual agreement, when we, we sign off the last page of the contract, and contract is a very loose term. Uh, <laughs> it's very short, actually in English, which a lot of the other contracts are, are not. Um, the last page is just basically a statement that says if anyone tries to change or, you know, modify your treatment or get you to do things you're not comfortable with, you're supposed to report them so they can let go of those people. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and that is exactly why it's, it's one of my favorite questions because it is definitely a very, very common, popular misconception. So I actually encourage people asking that question. So it's something that we can definitely address and kind of get out of the way. Uh, Natalie, do you have anything to add on that from a hygiene perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, just really backing what a uh, doctor said, we have a lot of autonomy, definitely no quota, quotas that have to be met. Um, it's very, very nice. Yeah, definitely. And just to kind of um, add on to what Paul said earlier, I do like to address this as well. Um, when he kind of touched on contracts, um, within Aspen, we kind of like to say we have letters of agreement because, I don't know, it's, it's a super, super short letter of agreement. We don't have any restrictive covenants, no time restraints, no radius clause. Um, we want our doctors to want to be here. We feel that they are going to provide the best service to our patients when they want to be here. Uh, so within these letters of agreement, uh, if you end up not wanting to stay with Aspen, you can go work across the street if you want to. I think ultimately they just ask that you, you don't take your patients with you, which I think is pretty standard within the industry. Um, so with that being said, we will move on to our next question we have here. Um, let's see, how many dental assistants do you have working in your office? And as the hygienist, do you have any assistance for you? Um, Natalie, do you wanna start this one? Sure, um, we have three dental assistants working each day, typically. Um, I do not have an assistant, but I know that when we came back from COVID, they gave me the option to use a dental assistant as needed um, with suctioning the cavitron, things like that. So um, I do have the option to, but I have not um, taken advantage of that. Um, but it's nice to have the option. Yeah, and I do think that is definitely a, a, up to the hygienist. So like you said, the, that is the option there if you would like to have the assessment, assistant working for you. Um, and Paul, how many dental assistants do you have working in your practice? We have uh, three currently, um, and we do share an, uh, an assistant um, when my hygienist feels it's necessary. Usually, though, uh, when she's geared up, we have uh, ISO drives, and she'll use an ISO drive just for you know high speed evacuation there, and uh, usually works pretty well. Mm -hmm. Just to piggy uh, off of that as well, I got a high speed suction that I'm using, which is why I haven't needed an assistant. Oh, thank you for for um, following up that. And sorry, we did have a follow up question just pop up. Um, to that. How many hygienists are in each office? Do you have more than one? I know you mentioned you're the only one in your practice, Natalie. Paul, you only have one? Awesome. Yeah, I do know it is kind of a, a running joke here uh, at Aspen. Uh, I've heard a lot we have one in 1.5, one and a half hygienists in each office. I know a lot of them have uh, a full-time hygienist and a part-time part hygienist. I do think it depends on on the patient flow, some of our offices have two. Uh, it's one of those that just kind of is on a, a per office basis. Um, let's go to our next question here. 
I know you touched on this a little bit earlier in your introduction, Paul, but this says, what is the clinical autonomy like as a dentist? And we will do that as a hygienist as well, but would you like to go first, Paul? Uh, sure. So uh, kind of the, the practice I work at, I'm, I'm the only doctor there. So I mean, it makes it really, really simple. I see all the new patients, I diagnose treatment, and then I, I perform the treatment. So I have, uh, you know, kind of complete autonomy with uh, what I'm treat, uh, treatment planning. Now, every now and then and during training, you know, uh, you might work as an associate or you might work with another doctor and it's, uh, you know, you guys meet and you'll kind of decide who should do what and how, how things go about it and you kind of uh, align and figure out what, uh, what your treatment philosophies are so that you can, you know, work together appropriately. So it's going to be a little, little different associate uh, uh, MCD position, but yeah, there's no, uh, you know, no pressure to do anything that you're not comfortable with. Awesome. And do you have anything to add on to that, Natalie? Um, there, there was a part-time hygienist at Vancouver that was working every Friday. So for a while there, there were kind of two hygienists in a sense. Um, so, but most of the time I'm seeing all of the new patients, we were really calibrated on agreeing on treatment planning and things like that when we worked together um, so it worked out really well, but for the most part, there is a lot of autonomy. I see all the new patients diagnose what hygiene needs to be done and follow through with the cleaning. Awesome. Yeah, that, that is definitely, uh, something that I know is a, is a big benefit within our company, um, that our clinicians have pretty much full clinical autonomy within their practice. Uh, and something, again, I did want to touch on, I know the term MCD was used. And for those of you who don't know, MCD stands for Managing Clinical Director. Uh, and that is a fancy way of saying a lead doctor. And that is what Paul is down here. So uh, if you hear us or specifically him use the term MCD, that just means he's the lead doctor running the practice. Um, and we did have a follow-up question, uh, which I think you just answered, Natalie. Somebody asked, uh, so there are part-time opportunities for hygienists. And I think you, you touched on that a little bit saying, yes, there definitely are. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, we're actually looking for a second hygienist now just to do double hygiene a couple days a week. So that would open up a part-time position there. But I know sometimes they want the part-time positions to be able to float or go around to different offices and um, fill in as needed. So there are definitely uh, multiple ways to go about filling your schedule. Yeah, if there's anything I do know, it's, uh, it can be very, very flexible. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what are the hours like in the office? And again, this is for both the doctor, Paul, you can touch on this, and then Natalie for a hygienist as well. But if Paul, you wanna go over the hours that you're working? Sure. I work uh, pretty standard hours for Aspen. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I work seven to five. On Thursdays, I work nine to seven. And then Friday is a half day at seven, but I leave at noon. Mm -hmm. And Natalie? I work uh, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday from seven to five. Our Tuesday is our late day, which is eight to six. And a half day on Friday from seven to noon. Awesome. So our, I know some of our offices are open maybe like one Saturday a month. Do either of you guys do that? Yep, we do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, I think, one of those that depends on the, uh, the patient flow within the office. But uh, just so everybody knows, some of our offices are typically open one Saturday a month. But I think you both follow a pretty standard uh, work schedule for our practices. Um, this is a good one right here. How does the treatment planning go in the office between the dentist and the hygienist? Um, and then can you elaborate on the relationship that you each have with uh, your Natalie, your doctor, and Paul, your hygienist? Um, do you want to go first, Natalie? Yeah, sure. Um, I, in our office at the new patient exams, I go in first. I take an overall look at the mouth, do perio charting. Um, things like that, and then diagnose hygiene uh, at that time. And then doctor goes in after me and goes over any other treatment plan for the patient. Um, there are times that in between me going in and her going in, um, we talk about, you know, something that I 
have questions about or concerns or whatever it may be um, is usually that's usually when we communicate sometimes after the fact but usually in between or she'll come to me after if needed um, so we definitely collaborate and talk you know go over treatment plan overall for patients mm -hmm. yeah that sounds great and Paul do you want to talk about the relationship that you have with your hygienists and how you guys go about treatment planning yeah, definitely. So uh, my hygienist, her name is Prudy. We, uh, when we see new patients, um, our DA, you know, takes x-rays, see patient health history, that type of thing. Hygienist is going to come in. She does our perio charting. She'll do oral cancer screening. And we have uh, an itero, so she'll do an oral health uh, scan of the dentition. And most likely it, it's pretty clear what kind of perio treatment uh, they need. It's sort of rare where, you know, someone's right on the cusp and you're thinking like, oh, do we do scanline replaning? Do we do, you know, gingivitis therapy? How's it going to go? So we've met, you know, a number of times and gone over like where our cutoffs are, which is, you know, the, the cutoffs from the American Academy of Periodontics. Um, but yeah, if there's any kind of questions in the time after she goes in, before I go in, we'll, we'll be like, hey, you know, I'm thinking of doing X, Y, and Z. What do you think? And we'll kind of talk to it and come to an agreement what we think makes the most sense for the patient. Um, sometimes I'll go in and they're like, oh, no, I want dentures. And of course, then our perio treatment plan uh, is, is not there anymore. It's just extractions. But um, we, uh, we meet every morning and, and kind of look over, uh, you know, the, the workflow and just make sure it, it's divided up so that we're giving as uh, much time as we can to our patients and just giving them the best care. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely think that is an extremely important relationship to have between the doctor and hygienist in the office. And I mean, clearly it seems like you guys both have a great one. And I do want to, uh, again, touch on, Paul mentioned the uh, iTero scanners within the office, and I do believe pretty much all of our offices should have those by now. Do you have one, Natalie? We do. Yeah, and um, from the hygienists that I've spoken to, they have talked about how much of a benefit it's been to have the iTero scanners in the office and be yeah. able to show patients, you know, right in front of their face what they need fixed and it's really helped with their treatment planning when patients are able to to actually see it. Would you agree with that? Oh, 100%. Yeah, it is. Um, in hygiene school, we took intraoral camera pictures, which is not as um, nice as the iTero scan. So I was just so thrilled when we when I found out that we were using this and I use it all the time for um, patient education. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Um, and moving on here, um, can you tell us what your average day to day in the office is like? Um, so, so I assume, you know, maybe what time you get to the office, when you head out, how many patients you're seeing, uh, what are the, the most common procedures that you guys are doing? Uh, do you want to start this one off, Paul? Uh, sure. So uh, I get in about uh, 6.45, which is when we have our mar morning huddle. We just kind of go over anything from the previous day that we're addressing and kind of look at the schedule and figure out how we're going to do things. Um, I try to schedule, uh, you know, a biggish procedure, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So that might be a full mouth extraction. That might be a crown prep or a quad of filling. I tend to go in and get that patient numb first. Then I'll go over and I'll see a, a new patient, do some diagnoses. Um, we have what's called an overflow column where we do, you know, dentures and things. So I might go do a, a wax try or a wax bite or something. And then I'll go back and do my, uh, my procedure. Um, for some procedures, like a full mouth, I might do the top arch, go see another new patient, do, uh, you know, another wax try, come back to the bottom arch or for fillings and, uh, uh, crown preps and whatnot with the COVID reg regulations and the PPP we, we wear, it's a little harder for me to exit those. So I'll probably stay in that room for uh, uh, the entire procedure there until, uh, well, until my assistant makes the provisional because I don't know how to make provisional. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah and so that's the, that's the typical flow. I try to, you know, not do too many big procedures. Um, back to back because that way if something goes long or something needs more attention, you know, I don't have to be like, oh no, I've got another surgery coming in. It's, uh, you know, easier to, 
to, you know, push a, a little filling by 10 minutes than a, a bigger procedure. Mm -hmm. And um, I will say you mentioned COVID and I just want to let everybody know that I did have quite a few COVID questions, but just to keep everything organized, I will be um, kind of going over those uh, once we get through all of these questions, because <laughs> I, I do know that is what is on everybody's mind. Um, and so going back to that, Natalie, do you want to tell us a little bit about your day today in the office? Yeah, sure. Um, I get there at 645. We start the first appointment at seven. Um, I do similar to my with my schedule as a uh, doctor mentioned, I um, try to do like one big procedure in the morning. So usually an SRP um, for the same reasons I have to wear protective gear and it's harder to go in and out for new patient exams. Um, but usually one big procedure appointment in the morning and then one in the afternoon. Um, other appointments are usually adult profies or mostly perio maintenance appointments. Um, and um, stepping in between appointments to go see the new patients and diagnose hygiene treatment and um, oral cancer screenings. Awesome. Um, and here we have, how do you go about scheduling in your office? Can you make your own schedule? Do you pick how much time you have for procedures? Does your front office handle that? Um, do you want to, do you want to take that one, Natalie? Yeah. Um, I do not do most of the scheduling unless it is, um, scheduling continuing care appointments or future cleaning appointments. For the most part with the new patients, my front staff schedules them, but I tell them how much time I need um, per appointment or um, how many quadrants I want to do maybe during a scaling and root cleaning appointment or how I want it split up, things like that. So I have basically full control of my schedule. I just have, communicate with the front and uh, we make it work. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's definitely important that you have the, the allotted time that you think you need uh, yeah. to get the, the patients the care that they need. And Paul, what about you as a, a doctor? What is scheduling like in your practice? Uh, yeah, in, in huddles and uh, with working with my OM and my front, like we spend a lot of time on making uh, uh, the schedule productive. And it's kind of built around the fact that I can't be in two places at the same time. So I take a lot of control and schedules uh, done and e even a little bit on the hygiene side because we don't want to have uh, me inside of a procedure and the hygienist is waiting for me for a periodic exam so they can, you know, dismiss their, their profi patient or anything. So we, we have uh, just kind of some checklists of like, you know, we do one denture just morning and afternoon at this time. Uh, we schedule certain types of impressions first thing in the morning. We schedule big procedures first things in the morning. And then we kind of fill in around those um, with all the other types of things that we have. And it's uh, usually just uh, we, we use Microsoft Teams a lot. My OM will send a message like, hey, I'm going to put this extraction at this time. Is that okay? And I say yes. Um, yeah, it's uh, pretty good. Great. Yeah. And, you know, Dr. Lamoureux here's thrown out a lot of acronyms on you guys. Um, he mentioned, I think it was OM. I just want to let you guys know that was the office manager. <laughs> we basically use the whole alphabet here at Aspen Dental. You'll, you'll learn very quickly. <laughs> um, and here's a fun question. So this says, I'm graduating this year. Uh, mentorship is extremely important to me. What is the onboarding training process like for new hires? specifically new graduates. Um, I think, Paul, I'm going to have you start with this one. Yeah, so I had a little a little bit of a different pathway because I wanted to work in that area of the state I mentioned, Southern Oregon. And one of the things about it is we're looking for a, a lead doctor there. So it's a, a by-yourself by doctor. And I was like, ooh, I'm a new graduate. I don't know that that's a good idea. And I'm like, all right, well, we're going to, you know, spend some extra time with your onboarding. So what what are you not comfortable with? And I was like, well, um, and I just throw, throw out really quick, uh, Midwestern and ASDO students, you're not going to have this problem because you guys do some fancy uh, it, It's incredible. But at OHSU, like surgical extraction, that was me watching a resident do it. Um, 
you know, uh, implant. That's me watching the perio resident do it. That was a lot of my training, so I wasn't comfortable, you know, with some of these extractions or these different things that I'd need to do. It's my dog, Berkeley, going crazy. He uh, sounds like a so, big dog. <laughs> oh, she's tiny. She's like 50 pounds. Uh, but so they're like, okay, so let's focus on the surgery stuff. So they sent me up to, to Washington, and I spent a month with uh, Dr. Molesky, who's amazing. He's like a, a super GP. He does everything. He does, like, all on fours. He does implants. He does uh, molar endo standing up without loops on. It's incredible. Um, he's just absolutely amazing. And he taught me a lot about, um, you know, surgery and workflow and just how to – how to address different things and also how to build your case selection. He's like, you know, you don't want to jump in and, and start just doing practice molars or anything. It's like start here, go to here, go to here, go to here, build to that. Um, so I spent a month with him. And then I started after that the kind of normal onboarding experience, which is called the doctor development program, which is where I went and I worked with uh, another doctor, Dr. H up in Springfield. And I went in and kind of the first couple of days I just shadowed her. And then uh, the next couple of days I started working one of her columns. So I was just doing production. Like I was doing fills, crown preps, you know, simple extractions, things like that, realizing I'm really, really slow. And, you know, she worked with me on how to get better, how to, you know, manage workflow, things like that. And then I got production and she's like, okay, now we're going to mix in new patients. We're going to work on, you know, diagnosing and having you break from one room to another. So I did that for a week. And then uh, this horrible thing happened. They sent me to Miami for a week for a conference. So I had to put a pause on the development program. But went to Miami, learned some other stuff, came back, and then I started doing the overflow column as well. So by the end of it, I was running her complete schedule, which uh, was probably pretty awesome. That's what I hope to do eventually is just have someone else do all my work. That would be great. Um, and when I had a good handle on that and she was able to sign me off on the various different, you know, procedures, like he can do this, that, and the other thing, they're like, okay, let's send you down to, to Grand Pass and, and start your office. Now my office, uh, it only been, been around for like eight months at the time I went into it. So it wasn't a full schedule right off the bat. So I was able to kind of build into things and I've adjusted my, um, uh, my preferences for time, like a bunch of different times. Like it was like, oh, full mouth extractions. Like I need three and a half hours to do that. And now it's like, oh, full mouth extractions. That's an hour. You know, it's uh, you get pretty good the more uh, the more you do stuff. Thirty five hundred extractions and counting. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> and Natalie, do you have anything to say about the uh, mentorship and onboarding process as a hygienist? Yeah, um, when I was hired, I spent about two weeks um, training with a very awesome hygienist at a different office, and most of that time was just spent shadowing her, so seeing how the office runs, kind of what the hygienist's day looks like, um, things like that. Learning this um, online system or charting system, which wasn't easy, mm -hmm. um, and then after the two weeks, I went to my office and kind of started doing um, hygiene work and had another hygienist there to help with whatever I needed at that time, um, helped with new patient exams, you know, so I could kind of get the flow and hang of things. And then um, that was pretty much what the onboarding and training thing looked like clinically. There was some um, online courses that I did as well. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely know it's a uh, hygiene and a doctor training can be very different, but they're both a very guided process. They're not just yeah. going to throw you to the sharks, especially right. the, the new grads coming out. They know you're not nearly right. as quick as you're going to be once you, once you actually start working in the practice. So you, you have a mentor as a doctor and as a hygienist that will always be there for you. I know a lot of doctors, even Paul, this might apply to you, like reach out to their mentor after working for years and years and years. Um, it's just kind of, you build that relationship and they, they will always be a resource for you. And hopefully um, maybe Paul will be someone's mentor one day. <laughs> um, so moving on from that, we have, do you have a say in what equipment and supplies you use in your offices? Um, do you want to start this one, Paul? Uh, sure. When, uh, when I started, uh, my first day in the office, they handed me the Henry Schein catalog and they're like, 
uh, order stuff that you want. So I'm like, oh, this is incredible. <laughs> of course, I only really knew the stuff I used in school, uh, so I ordered that stuff. And then just through doing CE, and I have a lot of other, uh, you, I'm sure you're all part of a Facebook group or something with all your classmates and whatnot. And talk about, it's like, oh, I started using uh, this composite on the Chroma. It's super cool. And it's like, I want to use that, so I order it, and if I like it, switch over to that. Um, different surgical instruments, bursts, things like that. Um, it's only like if you're like looking at like, oh, I want a microscope or, or something. It might be, uh, you know, a conversation you have to have with your, your office manager, or your regional manager, or whatnot. But it's like, I've got a little Picasso laser that I use. It's a lot of fun. Um, anything that I've ever wanted to, you know, like try out, uh, we've been able to uh, to get and I've been able to, to, to use. So it's been really great in that regard. Mm hmm and Natalie, do you have anything to add? Yep, I um, get to order all the supplies that I use or hand out to patients. So it's very nice to um, just have pretty much free range. And I just try to do what's the best product, um, try different things. It's really a lot of um, opportunities out there. Yeah, great. And, and this is a question that I, I get often in my role. and. What I always say is, I mean, yes, you guys can use absolutely whatever supplies, equipment that you feel it works best for you and what you think is going to provide the best care to your patients. Uh, what's really a benefit about working for a big company uh, is, you know, we do have partnerships with companies like Paul mentioned, Henry Schein. So when you're when you're buying things in bulk, you can get them at uh, cheaper costs than than maybe a, a private practice would. So it definitely has a huge benefit when you're working with with an organization when it comes to supplies and equipment in your practice and in the, the price that you're getting them for. Um, Natalie, this one is for you specifically. What are the opportunities for growth like as a hygienist? And does Aspen have any non-clinical positions available for hygienists? Yeah, um, I know if you want to stay clinical, I don't know how much growth necessarily there is. I know you can be the lead hygienist at the office. Um, and then there are non-clinical positions. There are um, like territory hygiene managers. I'm going to butcher their <laughs> technical names because I don't know them off the top of my head. But then there's also regional hygiene um, manager. So there are definitely more opportunities to grow non-clinically as well, which was something that I thought was really intriguing about Aspen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the technical terms go into the, the alphabet of Aspen Dental yeah. that I was, was talking about earlier. Um, but yeah, I think you, you touched on that very well. I think that again is one of the big benefits of working for a large organization. There are so many opportunities outside of, of being chairside if that is what you want to do in the direction that you want to take your career. Um, I do know so many people on our, um, our TMHS territory manager uh, hygiene team, so many of them started out as hygienists. So many of our uh, directors of hygiene started out as hygienists for us. I think our um, senior vice president of the company for operations started, started out as a hygienist. Um, so if, if that is something that you possibly see your career doing, it's definitely an option for you uh, that, that a big organization like this can provide. Um, and I guess while we're on the subject, Paul, do you want to talk about the growth and career path that you can take as a doctor? Paul? Sure. Uh, <laughs> just, yeah, just collected my thoughts there. So, uh, <laughs> Start out kind of the typical pathways to, to work in an associate. We have two types of offices. We have what's called large group practices, which are ones that are basically they're they're owned by Aspen. There's not an owner doctor that uh, that oversees. And then called POP offices, which are um, ones that are that are owned. So there is a pathway to, to ownership where you can actually uh, you know own own your office. I know up in uh, Vancouver, that's one of Doctor Doctor Sager's offices. I think he has I don't know seven or so up in the Portland, Vancouver area. Dr. Molesky, I think, has seven up in uh, kind of northern Washington and Ohio. 
So one of the things that was interesting to me is, you know, I wanted that it was to be the grand staff, I wanted autonomy, but I didn't want, uh, you know, an ownership path with pathway. So all the uh, offices down in Southern Oregon are currently not owned. So that was part of the, you know, things, one of the reasons why I was like, well, I want to go down to this office because that kind of puts my, gets my foot in the door. Um, you know, you get to work with uh, one of uh, Brenna's relatives to, <laughs> to come on the, uh, the ownership. But that's something that I've been, been looking at so i'll go over with uh you know one of the ownership advisors you know every couple months or so just like sort of the pnls and the metrics for for my office and you know it's something that when it hits that level where it would make sense uh to own it then we'll enter that conversation they just don't want me in a position where it's like oh no now i have a practice loan and i don't i'm not making any money they want you you to be able to you know make the same income and be able to service your loan they actually want you to make more of that before you get into the ownership i feel like i'm going maybe way too in depth but yes ownership okay. opportunities <laughs> yes no that that just about covered it um we do know being a an owner is a is a big thing to a lot of doctors out there um so you do 100 percent own the practice and then admi aspen dental management inc is there to support you um, so that's kind of the, the growth and career path options that are provided for our doctors. Um, and here we have another question that says, my father is a dentist in his private practice, but if I work for him, I don't think I'll be able to see enough patients. Do you guys hire new grads? And as a new grad and a new employee, what would my schedule look like? Um, that sounds like a question for you, Paul. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I was a new grad and I was in, in fact hired, so uh, there is hope. Um, <laughs> so we do yeah. hire new grads. <laughs> it depends on what you're looking for, exactly, because so I was, I'm kind of different. I wanted to, like, oh, put me by myself and I want to own this office one day. But a lot of my friends that have come in, it's been like, you know, I want to work as an associate. I want that, that mentorship. So they're going to go into an office that has an MCD and they're going to work under, under that person and kind of, kind of learn and grow. And, you know, that might be that they work double doctors five days a week. That might be that, you know, they work uh, with that doctor mentor on some days and maybe other days they work by themselves. So Aspen is, is very good at, at kind of finding what you need and then cultivating it so you can grow. And I think that's something that I, I think is just really cool about the company. Yeah, and I think as, uh, to touch on that, as a new grad, what is really important to a lot of people and what should be is to see patients and to learn. And obviously the only way you're gonna do that is to see patients. Uh, and that's something that you don't have to work for uh, or yeah, don't have to work for when working for a uh, organization like Aspen. We get you the patients. Like we said, your job is, is to do the dentistry and we will get the patients in the door for you. Um, and let's follow that up with, what is the culture and team environment like in your practice? Um, do you want to answer that, Natalie? Sure. Um, I have probably one of the best teams. We all get along very well. We are all very um, driven on just providing the best care that we can for the patients. Um, we communicate really well together. I know Paul mentioned Microsoft Teams. We use that as well just to um, communicate throughout the day about patients and just, um, like I said, we just really treat everyone or try to treat everyone like they're our family or friend um, and it just works really well together. Mm -hmm. and what about you Paul? Well uh, so culture is one of the words that I think gets tossed around and asked a lot we like to say we have a yes culture and that's uh, you know the, the company itself I went to uh, a session in Atlanta it was called Vibe they kind of got it together told us a little bit about what Aspen was about and what really spoke to me is they said they kind of built this company with the idea of saying yes to the patient. Like, you know, the patient comes in and it's like, oh, do you see emergency? Yes, of course they see emergency. They come in and they're like, okay, I have this, this tooth that hurts. Can you do something about it today? Yes, we can do something about it today. And that's really the philosophy that we have uh, in my office. You know, if, uh, if the patient is coming in, it's like they're there, I'm there, the team's there. You know, if we can do something for them that day, we, we want to do that. And I don't, 
I don't want to brag or anything, but I think I'm number four in the top two percent day starts right now. Just to throw it out there. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so the the whole idea is, you know, the the dentist is a scary place that no one likes to go to, and you know, a lot of our patients have been to several different dentist offices, and they get that that kind of no experience, like, oh, this is her take care of me today. No, we can see next Thursday, you know, and we do uh, we want to avoid that wherever possible. If our patient is there and in the chair. We're going to do everything that we can to help them, be that, you know, giving them that same day care, be that, uh, you know, breaking down barriers to figure out, like, you know, how can we afford this? A lot of times that's the, the obstacle you run into is, like, uh, payment. So we work with, uh, you know, different third-party finance, financers. We have, you know, payment plans. We have a lot of different different ways to get that patient to, to be able to go under, undergo the treatment. And I know that, you know, once they come through the door, it's our whole team job is just to support that patient so they can, you know, get to oral health. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a, a follow-up to that uh, that was, so are you guys in contact with the other Aspen Dental clinicians and do you use them as resources? Which I think is a great question. Um, either of you, Paul, you want to take that? Yeah, I have uh, a number of uh, friends that joined Aspen the same time I did and we're in our own little phone group so we have a lot of what, what we might call like silly questions like, oh how are you guys doing this I'm afraid to ask my mentor because I don't want to think I'm an idiot um, <laughs> and then we have go through that group and it's like no no that's a good question and then uh, like I mentioned the doctors that I onboarded with uh, you know Dr. Molesky, Dr. Uh, Sauger, uh, Dr. Hussein I, I text with them pretty frequently it's like hey I'm running into this on denture adjust or, hey, uh, you know, when I section the 30, I keep missing the first case, you know, like whatever. And, uh, you know, sometimes we'll do a phone call or they'll, you know, direct me to resources. The, and we also have, um, there's a, a Facebook group that's just Aspen doctors that, uh, that I'm part of that's been really helpful. And then it's just everyone in Aspen is really, really good at wanting to support each other. So it seems like anytime I've been to an event where there's other doctors, we share contact information and then, you know, we're, we're texting throughout the day periodically. It's like, hey, I have this interesting situation. You know, how would how would you approach this? Or um, we have specialists that work in our office, endo, oral surgery, et cetera. And I will definitely send a, a, a picture of like a PA or something. It's like, hey, I have this. Do you want to do this extraction? Or how would you go about this? You know, different things like that. So that network and that, uh, that ability and that having those 800 offices full of providers is just an amazing resource. Mm hmm and, and what about you, Natalie? Do you uh, keep in contact with other Aspen Dental hygienists? Do you guys have a yeah. fancy group chat as well? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we do. I, I stay in touch with the hygienist that I was trained by. Um, a lot of times I'm reaching out to those um, territory managers and uh, directors if needed. Um, I think I probably communicate with them more than other hygienists in the area, but that's just because I don't know all of them yet. Um, but we definitely all stay in touch and it's great to have that support system because I am the only hygienist to be able to talk to other hygienists and communicate about different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I definitely think that's great. I know there's there's some Facebook groups as well and, and you guys definitely work together um, and, and utilize each other, which again is one of the benefits of working for an organization. You definitely have that communication aspect and I will say whenever you need help, it's, it is somewhere within the organization. There's always somebody to reach out to. Definitely. Um, so what type of support does the management side of Aspen that I'll provide for you. So how does ADMI help you within your office? Uh, Paul, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Like I really get to focus on just the, the dentistry part of being a dentist, which is great. Like um, kind of the entire front, the, you know, from the scheduling to the financing, treatment plan consultation, you know, that's all, all handed by my front office staff. They, they take care of that. We also have, uh, you know, a regional manager. We have a territory director, named Becky, who's awesome, who might be watching this video right now. Um, so just want <laughs> Give her a pay. shout out. He pay she well, paid yeah. him to say that. <laughs> but, you know, the additional training, additional resources that we bring to my office, uh, we're, we're like booked out into September. There's, we're, we're trying to get through, so we're looking 
doctor to work uh, some days a week in my office. We're also looking at starting the so that we can keep our, our uh, endos, our root canal procedures, you know, in-house. So instead of, uh, you know, telling the patient, oh, you got to go over here on this, it's like, no, no, come back here this day. We'll take care of it. Our, our doctor's going to do a great root canal for you, and then you can come see me, and we'll get a, get a build up in there or, or whatever. So it's like we uh, – we used to meet in person like every month, but now COVID it's more like, you know, phone calls and, and different things, but uh, they're giving us, you know, any support from the clinical side on whether it's, you know, see how to do procedures, uh, equipment, or you know, really any, anything that you can need. Awesome. Yeah. And, and Natalie, did you have anything to add about the support from ADMI? Yeah. Uh, just a lot of like what Paul mentioned. Um, it, we were meeting every month and they would just give feedback on um, anything from their perspective. And I could ask any questions from my end or get any support with literally anything. It's been amazing to have them, especially as a new grad hygienist, just to have that support system. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. And yes, I do um, definitely support all of those answers. I think that, um, that, I mean, that's obviously the benefit to working for a dental service organization. That's our job to support you guys uh, in whatever it is that, that may be that you guys need. Uh, and this is a big question right here that I definitely wanted to address. Uh, this is, do you guys offer CE? Um, if so, what kinds, how much, and um, who pays for it? So if someone wants to talk about the, the CE that we offer, um, Natalie, do you want to start? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm always getting emails about different CEs that are offered uh, through Aspen, and I have not had to pay for any of them to this day. So um, it's been a really awesome opportunity to have that. I That was something looking for a job that I was hoping um, I could get help and support with. So as a hygienist, I really appreciate all the CEs that we offer or that are offered to me. Mm -hmm. And Paul, what about you? Yeah, so so during uh, COVID, it was definitely a time where I was, uh, you know, less busy with the dentistry stuff. So I really, really took advantage of CE. I think I did over 75 hours of uh, implant-based CE through Aspen. Um, I've done a lot of CE. Uh, they'll actually, you know, send you to, to different things. So I went to Chicago uh, for uh, a program that was called EDGE. It was a center to around a lot of like diagnosis, treatment planning, case presentation, how do you talk to patients without sounding like a dentist, that type of stuff. Um, that was really, really good CE. And then uh, this Friday, I'm getting uh, Invisalign training, which I'm really excited about because, uh, you know, with the, with the iTero and doing the scans, we, we want to move into being able to, you know, moving some teeth around and that good stuff. So there's a whole uh, site through our, our internet that, um, you know, it's called learning and development. There's, you know, CE on everything that you could possibly imagine. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's fantastic. I, another one I did recently was uh, they had an endodontist do some root canal CE for us. Like there's no shortage of CE. And I feel like half the time I'm doing it in between patients. So really I'm getting paid to do the CE. <laughs> oh, yes. that's funny. Um, and yeah, just for, for those of you watching, we are offering um, free CE for um, people outside of Aspen as well right now. Um, if you are registered, I will send the link out to that after this call so you guys can go take a look at those as well and get some of your CE courses in. I believe we are doing that through uh, December as of right now, um, but I will definitely keep you all informed on that as well. Um, and that'll bring us into a little bit of the COVID questions that we had. And again, I tried to combine these because there were quite a few. Um, but just to, to sum it up, have you had any shortage of PPE within your office throughout COVID, uh, Paul? Uh, no, when we first uh, came back, because my office uh, was actually uh, one of the offices that was closed for a while. Um, Oregon, we had a, a pretty harsh, they said that we, in March, they told us we couldn't do non-emergent uh, non dentistry until like June 16th, they ended up rolling it back, but as a result, my office was closed for a couple months and I worked as a teledentist. Right when we came back, like day one, we had to wait for uh, all the PPE to be shipped to us, so that was the only time I was ever at a shortage. I've got, you know, a 
five N95 masks, gowns, face shields, you know, everything that she could ever want. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about your office, Natalie? We never shut down. We were doing emergency appointments um, during COVID or at the beginning of this whole thing. I obviously wasn't working because cleanings were not considered an emergency, <laughs> um, but we have been provided that PPE throughout all of that time. So we haven't experienced any um, shortage at any time. Yeah, that's great. I do know, um, I believe it's through Henry Schein that uh, Aspen is one of the largest purchasers of PPE in the country. So I don't think any of our offices have um, experienced any shortage with that. And uh, on my last uh, Ask Me Anything session, I know that the doctor, doctors were saying they, they came to work. It was in their, their storage closets. Like it just, it wasn't even a worry for them. Yeah. Um, yeah, to have, to have PPE in their offices, which I think is great, especially as at a time like this. Um, what types of protocols and policies have put into place to help protect the staff and patients from COVID and your offices? Um, Natalie? Um, so we are all doing our own screenings uh, all employees in the office at the beginning of the day do temperature checks and record any symptoms um, if they were having any. And then every patient is going through that same screening process um, before coming into the practice. Um, and then as far as PPE, we're all wearing our masks all the time. Um, during aerosol producing procedures, we have uh, full gear, so hair edge, face shields, um, disposable lab coats, uh, foot shoe covers, um, we've got it all. So, um, and then we're also extending appointment times as needed, um, just to make sure there's, or staggering the appointment, making sure there's not too many people in the office at one time, um, making sure there's enough time in between patients for cleaning and sanitizing, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and what about your office, Paul? Uh, I think I think Natalie really nailed it there. I mean, that's, uh, you know, the temperature checks. Uh, you know, we don't use our, our waiting room anymore. So a lot of patients call when they get to the office, and then we go bring them in when the room is ready. So we just kind of the amount of people that are in um, in the office. Um, every every patient that comes, comes in gets uh, asked COVID questions you know, for screen and get their temperature taken. Uh, we had, I, I think, just one patient that they were like, well, I, I just tested, uh, took a COVID test because I might have had an exposure at work. And we're like, oh, can you come back after you get a result of that test? And then they came back like two days later with a negative result. So, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, which, which was good. We were kind of worried there for a second. So, yeah, just, mm -hmm. uh, just limit the amount of... Uh, Body concept, you know, amount of people in the office have a uh, you know, people in an operatory rules, patient, the, the doctor, and the assistant. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Um, and I think that kind of answers this other question. Someone wanted to know um, if your office has had to shut down temporarily. And um, I mean, it seems like you, if you were open, you were open just for essential procedures. Um, someone wanted to know if, if we had to let go of any employees. Um, and I will say that I think Aspen Dental did a great job of kind of getting ahead of it. Um, some, some employees were furloughed, but in the end, I think, I mean, being furloughed is never great, but it definitely is what prevented people from having to get let go. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that I think Aspen Dental came out ahead and kind of got in front of it from the beginning um, and prevented employees from having to be let go. Um, and just, it's about eight o'clock right now. Um, so there were two questions that I wanted to end on really quick that I thought would be great. One, one was from the Google form and one was submitted on here. Um, but just to close it out, uh, what advice do you guys have for student doctors and student hygienists graduating this year who are gonna be looking for jobs? Uh, Natalie, do you want to start? Yeah, I would just say um, don't jump on the first opportunity. Definitely explore your options. Um, 
really ask questions about what you're looking for in a practice and see what place feels like it fits best for you. Um, I, I know a couple hygienists that kind of just took the first job offer they were given and um, ended up finding somewhere else pretty quickly. So um, just know what you want and look for it. Awesome. And what about you, Paul? What, what wisdom do you have for your viewers? Uh, the best wisdom I can bestow on any word is just, it's just two words, and that is Mary Rich. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. No, no, I think, uh, I think Natalie did a really, really good job. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm really funny. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Oh, come here. Uh, no, but uh, it, exactly what she said. I mean, don't take the first opportunity that comes your way. It might be the best opportunity, but you uh, have something to compare it to to really know. So, you know, um, start interviewing, start putting feelers out there. Just because you know Aspen Dental was a great, great fit for me does not mean it will be a great fit for you. Um, that's what's great about uh, dentistry in general. There's a lot of different ways to practice. You find the thing important to do it or you're in a place where you're happy to go to work every day. Mm -hmm. Well, I think those are both great answers. And I, I think you guys hit the nail, um, which is make sure that you explore your options. Um, I think that that's probably the, the most important thing and you will find exactly what, what fits you and what you need in your career and in your lifestyle. And this last question was submitted and I, I'm pretty sure it's directed towards Paul um, and we will close on this one. I think it's the most important question of the night. Uh, this one says, Paul, um, go ducks or go beavers? <laughs> I actually, oh, I'm, I'm wearing a, uh... I'm wearing duck shorts. Like, so, yeah. uh, well, I, I hope whoever asked that question agrees with you. <laughs> I graduated from U of O, and I got to tell this story really quick. Through physics, anatomy, and uh, uh, biology, my lab partner, Mariota, so the year that he won Heisman, I was actually, uh, you know, his study partner. So I, I get to claim just a tiny tiny percent of that just growing yes your your claim to to Mariota's success right there <laughs> well that's great um and like i said it's a little bit after eight o'clock here so we can go ahead and close this thing out um i really appreciate all of you guys who who logged in um and a huge thank you to both of our panelists you guys were great um, I know that uh, they would be happy to speak with anybody one-on-one -on -one who's interested and has any more clinical questions. I will send out a follow-up email for, for everybody so you guys will have my information. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask and, and follow up. Um, but again, thank you guys. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. But we'll go ahead and close this out. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs>